Good evening and welcome to the Cancer Education Series. My name is Chris Goodale and I'm the Executive Director of Above and Beyond Cancer. The Cancer Education Series is brought to you by Mercy One and Above and Beyond Cancer. This evening, our uh, moderator for tonight's activities will be our founder, Dr. Richard Deming. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Deming now. Dr. Deming. Hey everybody, welcome. Hey Judy, hi Poon, hey Tim. Hello. So we've got a live studio audience tonight in addition to uh, those of you uh, who, who are watching uh, from home. So thanks, real treat tonight. So a friend of mine, a patient of mine and a colleague of mine. So it's my pleasure to introduce Larry Conrad. Larry is a hospital chaplain at Mercy been a chaplain there for 25 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so Larry has uh, helped many, many, many of my patients over the years. And uh, this last year, he had his own journey and uh, was on the other side of the stethoscope, as we say, and um, got to be a journey mate and team mate with him along the way. And I asked Larry to join us uh, tonight to talk about two different perspectives. Um, interested in having him share his perspective as a hospital chaplain. You know, what is a hospital chaplain? What do you do? And how do you help improve the quality of life of our patients? But then secondly, and maybe even more importantly, um, share his own perspective, his own cancer journey. And then I'm really interested in how his cancer journey may have transformed uh, the way he practices his specialty of being a hospital chaplain. And first, I'm just going to turn it over to Larry to talk a little bit about himself. He has a few things he wants to share, and then we'll come back together and have a conversation. But I'm going to give you the stage here, Larry, oh, okay. for a bit, and then uh, and then we'll I'll come back in after you share a few things, and we'll have a conversation. Okay. Okay. All right. Sure. All right. Thank you. Hi. Well, thank you for having me. I've been at Mercy for 25 years. I was a United Methodist pastor for 10 years before that. I've lived in Nashville, Tennessee, Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up in St. Louis. My wife's from Southern California. So just uh, quite a little mix uh, where we're from. And we were sitting at an iCub game a few years ago because we think we travel all the time. And we did. And then when my youngest son was born, we stopped. And so we've lived in central Iowa now for 33 years. And that's how I can tell how long I've been in Iowa. And that's how I can tell how old he is. So it works out pretty well. Um, I, um, the difference for me between being a chaplain at Mercy and being a pastor of a congregation has largely been that in a congregation, you get to journey with people throughout every aspect of their life from from birth all the way to the end and everything in between. And you get to know those people and love those people and care for those people and go through all the ups and downs with them, but you also have a lot of administrative responsibility for an organization. Uh, and that can be wearing at times. And so what I've uh, liked about being at Mercy has been that I can, it's a greater emotional intensity in a way um, but then I can leave, and there's somebody that follows after me. Um, and uh, you're with people at a very vulnerable time in their life, uh, a very uh, crucial time in their life, turning points in their life. And it's a great privilege uh, when people have very little energy to be invited in to those times in people's lives. And uh, as Dr. Deming said, I had some experience um, doing that myself this last year. Um, I've, I've normally I uh, I haven't written anything to talk about since I was in high school uh, because I normally just kind of talk like this, but I'm very fresh with this story, and uh, I'm just now passing some anniversaries of the beginning of this journey. So to kind of control my emotion, 
I've written um, a lot of this so that I can kind of uh, stay together when I talk about it. And uh, so I want to kind of give you a little bit about my journey. And I entitled this, Take Someone With You, because um, that was advice that I got on day number two. And when I get sick, typically I kind of go off to myself, you know, if you have strep throat or something, uh, one, people don't like to be around you and you don't feel like being around people. So I kind of isolate myself and, you know, tough it out and, and look silly and, you know, kind of wash it all away with a shower at the end of the day and then feel better. Uh, this was something I had never come close to anything like this in my life. Um, this was a very different experience for me. And a lot of the things that I would share with other people were now being shared with me. As he said, I'm on the other end of the stethoscope here and it's different. And when my, my mother and father would be hospitalized, I had experienced the hospital through the eyes of a family member. Um, but I had never been a patient in a hospital until last year. In fact, when they looked me up in the emergency room, they had no record of me because I'd never been in an emergency room <laughs> patient before. This was all brand new to me. So I wanna share a little bit about kind of how this began and what the importance of this advice was for me on day two. Because the advice was, you know, when you go to the doctor, take somebody with you, you've been told that. Um, and I had recommended that many, many times to family and patients and friends but nobody ever told me to do that. And my wife had never been to the doctor with me um, other than a couple of times for a procedure to make sure I got there and got home, but she'd never been to a doctor's appointment with me. And uh, outside of birth, I'd only been to one doctor's appointment with my wife. So this was a brand new experience for, <laughs> so for us. So last April, I got into my truck, I park, uh, usually north of university, north of the hospital. I got into my truck, and when I slid into my truck, my leg, uh, there was a bump on my leg, which I couldn't believe. And I'd been riding a new exercise bike. I was trying to get in shape for my September physical, and I usually don't ride indoors, but I bought this new exercise bike. It had kind of a funny seat on it. And I thought, that is right where, you know, that's right where my leg is repetitively hitting that seat. So that must be it. And so I better just take a break from that. That's why a lot of people don't ride a bike anyway. You get, you know, kind of a bump or something. So that's what it was. And by then COVID struck and the clinic system was a mess. The hospital was changing. And, you know, frankly, lancing a boil, I didn't figure was, you know, going to be a big deal. So the pandemic continued and my wife and I began talking about what we were gonna do emotionally and spiritually to stay healthy and to stay safe because this looked like it was gonna be a long haul. So we made some adjustments, but we did not realize that this soft lump would take us on a journey within the broader COVID journey. As I started riding my bike outside and the clinic system stabilized on June 3rd, I made an appointment with my doctor. And to my surprise, she wanted an MRI and she wanted it the next morning. And so she worked me in at another clinic for eight o'clock the next morning. And the tech, um, again, it was my first MRI and uh, she helped me through that. And um, the tech said probably three to two or three business days to hear anything back. Okay. So a few hours later, I was standing talking to a nurse in uh, one of the areas I cover, and my doctor called herself, personally. And um, she said, it's pretty big. And I had only felt this soft lump. I didn't realize there was something going this way and something going this way. And she said that she'd taken the liberty to set up an appointment with what I believe was one of our top surgeons in just a few days. And uh, she said they might want to radiate that. And I thought, radiate that? 
And then she said, take someone with you. And if you ever want to talk to somebody during this process, I'm available for you. So I wrote the surgeon's name on my census, the date and the time. I showed it to the nurse I was talking to. And she just kind of nodded, kind of surprised. And I thought, she thinks I have cancer. <laughs> and so I date the diagnosis as June 3rd last year. That's when she knew. And I felt just by the way she's acting, she thought I had cancer. And by the time she said radiation, I thought, she th she's pretty sure I have cancer. So June was full of scans and appointments, uh, bewilderment, anger, uh, fear. Uh, telling my sons was one of the most difficult. Um, and cancer in the thigh, I never heard of that. And I used to cover the oncology area of the hospital. Um, preserving a functional leg, removing part of my hamstring. Um, am I gonna end up limping a little bit? Will I not be able to walk on uneven ground like my father who'd had Parkinson's? Um, maybe I'm not gonna be able to walk at all. But I don't know. Um, I hadn't even had a cold in four years. And I'm gonna go from riding my bicycle 2000 miles the year before. And they said this could spread to the lung. Am I gonna go from that to metastatic cancer in a few months? That was my fear. And that's what we were looking at. And then you think about your mortality. And I did my first funeral when I was 25 for somebody younger than me. So I've thought about this all my life and my wife and I have talked about it all of her life too, but it had a real immediacy that it had not had before. Uh, and anger, um, you know, I think being sick is part of life, but um, I was angry at myself. I work in healthcare for goodness sake. Anybody that I walk around could have, could have told me you need to get moving on that, but I just had, you know, minimized it. So that's what a coulda, shoulda, as my sons call it. And so I, I put that aside uh, fairly quickly. And I also never Googled anything. In one year, I did not Google anything related to this because just because I work at a hospital doesn't make me a doctor uh, or somebody with that kind of knowledge. And I just didn't have the framework to understand all the information that would be coming at me. So I didn't Google anything. Um, but there was that advice, take someone with you. Now, who's that gonna be? I wondered if my wife wanted me to take some healthcare friends, you know? What did she wanna do? My wife's very tenderhearted and I wasn't sure how she would react to that. Um, but we decided that we were gonna go through this together. Um, all through the tumult, we had a common planner where we could keep track of all my appointments and we would write down questions um, that she would come up with or I would, or that the family would filter into us so that we'd have them. But uh, what I wanted to do was to be able to focus on what my doctors told me. Um, my mom used to write down everything and she could tell me dad's blood pressure, but couldn't tell me what he'd been diagnosed with. So I wanted to be able to hear the way my doctors, nurse practitioners presented things to me and not be distracted by a bunch of note taking. And that was some of the best things that we did, but I needed somebody to go with me to do that. And, and we decided to be open about it. There was, uh, we prepared for each visit. I remember one night though, we decided we've been through enough. We need to just kind of not talk about healthcare. I don't want to hear about the pandemic. I don't want to hear the C word. I don't want to hear anything like that. So we were going to watch an old episode of Gunsmoke. And uh, the one that we had lined up, you know what the title of it was? Quarantine. <laughs> Quarantine. There was a pandemic that broke out. And that was our hour of, you know. <laughs> and then there's fastest. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. We watched another thing. We were same kind of night. And they diagnosed a horse with a lump in his leg. And they were going to treat that too. We see why we couldn't get away with it. Um, but that was the tumultuous time. That was just a year ago one year ago. 
And uh, the surgeon confirmed what I had. He recommended that I consult another physician that he highly seemed to highly respect because he recommended this twice. Dr. Deming knew the surgeon as well. And it seemed like Dr. Franco really wanted me to talk to this guy. So we headed off to uh, the University of Iowa. And um, he seemed like he had all the time in the world for us. We were as nervous as we could be. Uh, like I say, I, I work with physicians, but I'm usually not treated by them. And so this was a very different experience for us. But I remember he said uh, that this was in a, a fairly good location, as this goes. He said, I think you'll do really well. And he said, um, I said, how do I make this decision? How do I, how do I know what to do. And I remember he said, um, make the decision the way you would normally make a decision and then don't look back. Just, just know that you made the best decision for you at that time and don't look back. I thought, well, okay. And I talked to Dr. Deming about that and uh, we decided that that's the way we would go. So I felt like Healthcare professionals were on this journey with me, not just my wife, not just my family, but all the people who were taking care of me. And uh, so we were asked for a radiation oncologist. And I said, well, I feel like I know Dr. Deming. And so that's where we went. And I also wanted a doctor that I felt my wife could talk to. Because I wasn't sure that maybe she might be doing maybe more talking with the doctor than me. I don't know. And uh, so we had, uh, and I told her, I said, I think he will help us put the pieces together, what the plan is, what the diagnosis is. And um, we had a, uh, our initial consult, which, um, I would say was um, possibly the most healing in a holistic sense, the most healing 90 minutes of my life. Um, we felt, um, and I remember you looking at me, and uh, just, I didn't know if I could do this. I didn't know if I had the stamina to do that. And I remember uh, in your concluding remarks, I remember thinking, well, if you and Kelly and you are going with me, maybe I can do this after all. Uh, never forget that one. Um, so, uh, all of the healthcare professionals I saw, they were always informed, they were always prepared, and they were always uh, compassionate. Always had time for me, always had time to communicate with my family. Um, we, I went through 25 radiation treatments, which um, frankly, I looked forward to. Um, and I wasn't going to a birthday party. I knew that, but it was near the end of my day and uh, I was very well cared for. And um, I felt that, especially after that consult, I felt that no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay. And I knew that uh, the healthcare professionals taking care of me were doing everything humanly possible to help me. And so I look forward to, to seeing them. Um, Larry, when you were going through the radiation, you were still working full time. I was at the hospital, and obviously you were at the hospital. Um, could you let, was the tumor ever out of your mind or was it uh, in your mind throughout the day while you were working? 
uh, and coming in for the radiation. Obviously, you come in for the radiation, it's, it's, it's on your mind because we're lining you up and yeah. doing the treatment. Yeah. Uh, what was it like working in the hospital all day and then coming down at the end to get to your treatment? Well, it got to where it was, um, I was very aware of it because I was limping so badly. And um, I uh, occasionally, telling people was difficult. You know, we were in the middle of a pandemic, um, but I was very aware of it. And it got to where it was hard for me to sit and to make my patients feel comfortable, I needed to be able to sit so that I, I didn't look rushed. So that affected me. Um, but so I was aware of it, but I kind of felt like when I go down here, uh, I'm gonna, you know, they're gonna be, they're gonna take care of me and I can lay here on this table and knowing that, that we're doing what we have to do, uh, yes, to get this done. <laughs> Sorry, he's chuckling because we, we could show you all the <laughs> what the tools look like. It's a, yeah. So the first time I met you is a patient. Yeah. I said, well, let me, because I'm hearing the story. Yeah. And I said, well, let's just kind of see this. And yeah. Of course, I had you turn around because it was part of the hamstring. That's right. It was in the hamstring. And, and uh, it, it dawned on Larry as I took the picture and showed it to him. We don't look the, at our hamstrings very often. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> I never and it's amazing how you can grow a football uh, in your yeah. hamstring without yeah. knowing it's there. Yeah. Yeah. He asked me, have you ever seen this? And I said, no, I haven't. I haven't. I could feel a lump, but, you know, it's, it's like the frog boiling in the water. It, it's such a gradual change. You just don't feel it. And I didn't. And that's part of why I felt so silly, especially when he showed me. What it looked like. How could I not be aware of that? But I, I just, I just wasn't. Um, so I, sorry, I interrupted. Oh, you're but you were, you were talking about coming down for treatment right. every day, and so now right. you're getting through with your treatments, right. your radiation treatment, right. knowing that the the plan for Larry was the right. 25 radiation treatments, then yeah. about a month off, and right. then surgery. That's right. Yeah, and that was then I was kind of in between things then, but again. I felt like last year, many times I was by myself. And my wife said, you know, you come in and tell me what a great experience, or how everybody's taking good care of you. And I've been sitting in the car, you know, those were visitor restrictions at times. But we had a weekly meeting with Dr. Deming that we could both join in on so we could sense the progress. But, you know, there were, the limping is what bothered me and got to frustrate me because it kind of, you know, kept me from moving in a normal way. And that's what I felt. And I would soak in a tub at night uh, because that brought me some relief, you know, doing that. So my life was beginning to change and, you know, around, uh, around that. But again, Dr. Franco stopped me in the hallway. I was always surprised how people remembered me. And he said, um, how's this going? And I told him, and he said, uh, you know, the tumor can be rough on the patient, but remember it's, it's rougher on the tumor. And I thought, hmm. you know, again, I never had anything like this. And when I got to the uh, University of Iowa the day before for a bunch of scans, uh, the nurse practitioner looked at me and she said, you have a dead tumor. And I said, what? <laughs> and that was the first thing Dr. Miller said. He said, you have a dead tumor. And I thought, my goodness, a dead tumor. And the pathology report revealed that about 70% of the tumor had been killed. And when I had surgery on 9-11, he made a complete removal of the tumor. And that removed all of the cancer. They'd done a scan of the lungs the day before uh, as well. And that was clear. And I was in the hospital. I had a very long incision. And I was in the hospital uh, the 11th, the 12th. And I went home on the 13th and uh, walked up the stairs home. My son thought he was there. He thought he might have to carry me in because I had a walker. Uh, but um, I walked the day after surgery. Uh, I remember that vividly, a very caring physical therapist. Um, and then, you know, I was supposed to just be quiet, which I, I think I did. And um, 
uh, eventually started physical therapy. There were some turning points and all of that, but, um, and I had an infection in December. Uh, I was hospitalized, but I had, uh, I had been told to, that that was a real possibility. That was very disheartening for all the progress I'd made. Uh, that was very difficult emotionally. Um, but fast forward, uh, May 18th, um, this past May 18th, I went for the first weeknight bike ride in one year. Uh, I rode 22 miles. I saw a beautiful, beautiful sunset over Big Creek. And it was a full moon that night and I saw a beautiful full moon rise as the sun went down. And uh, one of my friends had organized kind of a, it's a wonderful life type thing. And uh, I received texts, emails, uh, cards, gift cards. I cannot say enough about the support I had from uh, my coworkers, my neighbors, uh, friends, in addition to the healthcare professionals um, who went with me all along the journey. Um, I would not be where I am today were it not for the people who came with me. And uh, I'm much more emotional since this happened. And um, more emotional in the sense of uh, the depth of gratitude, the depth of joy. The, the feeling of connectedness with other people, the web of relationships that I'm part of and how sustaining that is. Uh, in fact, I found when I laid in the scanners or waiting for surgery, um, I didn't go to the ocean or out in the woods. I thought about people who care about me. I would think about conversations I had in the hallway or uh, with my neighbor or with my family. And those are what brought me a serenity, uh, a calmness in the midst of, of all that. Because after that initial consult, I never again felt the turmoil. Not that I didn't get mad, not that I wasn't concerned and felt uncertain, but I never again felt the people that I had before. And when I go walking now, I think about the people who made this possible for me. And uh, there's, there's not a day goes by that I don't see their faces and hear their voice. Larry, you're at a point that I can come join you? Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. And um, you've already answered this partly, but uh, how do you think you um, uh, do your work as a chaplain differently now after your cancer experience than, than before? Is there anything that you uh, consciously do different? There may be things that subconsciously you, you do based on just uh, what you learned with your own experience, but I'm just curious whether you're aware of anything different in the way you interact with patients based on your experience of being a patient. Yeah, I'm much more aware of, um, I think I mentioned that I felt when my parents were hospitalized, I got the family experience. This really gave me some experiences with the patient. Laying there in that scanner, I'm, I'm aware when I talk to patients now, I am aware, much more aware of uh, uh, what runs through the mind. What are they gonna find? What difference will that make in how I live my life? What difference will that make in how I relate to my family? 
I mean, one of my goals was I just want to be able to play catch with my grandchildren. I would settle for that, you know, let alone all that I've been able to do. But those questions, um, I'm much more attuned to that when I talk to patients. I'm also much more aware of um, that I'm only getting a sliver of this. You know, I was hospitalized for two days. That's just a part of my life. That was all that those nurses and physicians saw of me, but that's just a part of it. And so I'm much more aware now of and ready to sit down and tell me how this stroke fits into your life. In fact, again, one of the things you did with me was to ask me about my life. How did you get here? Who's this? Um, how did you meet? So it placed my having cancer in the context of my overall life and where I am in this journey, which is kind of what I do when I talk to patients. Mm -hmm. I just was not as aware of how powerful that is. It is. And we, we call that narrative medicine. Yeah. So as we've talked before, I, I practice that before I even know it had, knew it had a name. And yeah. that's a name that's been uh, attached to this concept of, of letting, encouraging, actively listening and encouraging patients to tell their life story. Yeah. And um, the studies show that when a doctor and a patient are in a room together and the patient starts to speak, usually within 30 seconds, the doctor yes. is interrupting and focusing the conversation just down the path of, right. you know, who, what, where, when, why, just to get the, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Right. Um, and that, that narrative medicine is the opposite. It's mm -hmm. where'd you grow up? Exactly. Well, what's your claim to fame in high school? You know, exactly. where did you and your wife meet? Exactly. Uh, and that uh, you get to know the person. Mm -hmm. You don't get to know the tumor first, you get to know the person mm -hmm. and that caring for any disease process is not treating the disease, it's caring for a person who happens to have a disease. Yes. And so um, I'm hearing you say that, uh, that your experience, uh, you value how much that's part of the healing experience, yes. that the healing experience doesn't just come from the x-ray beam in the night, right. the healing comes from the interactions and you're aware of now even more how much your interaction with the patients you care for can be healing. It is. And I also am more conscious of the family that's accompanying the patient. Now, because of what I cover, I spend a lot of time with family, uh, but not 100%, but a lot, more than I did in some other areas. But I was aware, I'm more aware now to make sure that I'm interacting with family when the patient and I are together. Because for example, uh, in our conversation that we had, you mentioned uh, part of my wife's story and she mentioned her father. And uh, her father was a very important figure for her growing up and long after he's gone. And that identified a source of great strength for her. Um, and it did that early on in our journey. Um, when uh, sometimes you would say, you know, how's your wife? Or some of my coworkers would say, how's your wife doing? And I would go home and tell her, you know, I was talking to these people today and they asked about you or Dr. Deming asked about you, Dr. Miller asked about you. And uh, you remember my son came with me sometimes because I could see that we were giving him the facts, but not the rationale. And so I asked him, do you want to come with me? And you mentioned to him uh, at one point, you said, your father is very important to us. And we're doing everything we can to give him the best possible care. It meant a lot to him. And so um, I'm aware when I take a family from the ER down to meet my friends that we've been showing baby pictures, you know, or something, uh, that now, you know, when... Now they're working and I'm working and uh, they're taking very good care of that family. And as the patient, there's great relief to know that that family that you're journeying with is being included in your care. It's important. And like my wife has explained to me, it's a different journey. You know, she was, you remember, she's not a healthcare professional and yet she was caring for me. And so she felt like as an elementary school teacher, 
that now here I am at home and she's not always sure what she's seeing or what we should be doing. So as a chaplain, I'm trying now to be much more aware of the, the burden that uh, the sense of responsibility that people who are accompanying that patient are feeling and tending to that too. Yeah, and, and your wife is obviously very intelligent and very caring. And, mm -hmm. uh, but, but, and even when you're doing everything right, you don't know if you're doing everything That's right. right. That's one reason I give all of my patients my cell phone number and say, you know, call me anytime. If right. just a quick phone call can answer a question and mm -hmm. alleviate some concern. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one question I often ask, and I'm, proud, I'm sure I've asked you at this some point, one point in time where I walk in the room and I might say something like, Larry, what has brought you the most joy since the last time we got mm -hmm. together? Yes. Um, so what has brought you the most joy in the last day, Larry? Mm, let me think. <laughs> um, my, uh, my grandson was born. Uh, my youngest grandson was born at nine minutes after midnight yesterday. So, he was yeah. new, new grandson. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And what a thrill uh, yeah. to, to share that with him. And um, do you want to share with them part of the story about your grandson's weight? You don't have to do that. His weight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can share that. <laughs> Um, you know, I said, I said, and Larry, how much did your grandson weigh? Yeah, um, less than my tumor weighed. Yeah, yeah, but very close. But very very close. close. Grandson is seven pounds, three ounces, three ounces. And Larry's tumor weighed in at seven and a half. Yeah, wow. it's hard to imagine. So yeah. even even as we you know bring, there's a there's a way that. That story, you know, binds us. That journey is is ever fresh. I mean, it is even even to the extent of oh, my new grandson. That's about that was about the size of my daughter. It's, it's, it's the first thing I thought of when I saw the weight. I saw it at one o'clock that morning when my wife showed me the text. And I thought, well, that's that's about like you know, <laughs> yeah. That's the, the humor, you know, and patients share a lot of humor. Mm -hmm. um, people that are not on the inside don't always get that that's funny. And we found, because we kept a list of things that were funny, mm -hmm. and they were funny to us. Uh, they were not always funny to the uninitiated, mm -hmm. you know, we found. And when you have a tumor near your butt, I mean, yeah. it, it was a hamstring. <laughs> but true. when I examined you once a week, it was sort of like, okay, true. now's the time. Let me see your butt. That's true. And uh, getting radiation treatment. Right, right, right. So uh, fortunately, uh, obviously, we take it very, very seriously. And, the, you know, the first meeting, when we can spend 90 minutes and get to know each other and then come up with a plan. And so, I mean, here's the plan. And you then you go through the plan with hope and optimism and joy and humor and yeah. delight and uh, assume things are going to go just the way they are planned. Yeah. You know, and in talking with, uh, again, as in my role, Sometimes I can feel that people are trying to hang on and to control all aspects of what they're going through. And uh, I'm very meticulous, actually, about detail. Um, my wife and I differ on what details we're interested in, <laughs> which is part of our, our journey together. But um, I found that the more I find this myself and the more I'm working with our patients, uh, the more you try to hold on to it and control everything and understand everything, the more difficult it can be. Um, whereas if you just, well, when, in part of my training, one of my supervisors said years ago, he goes, you don't necessarily have to trust any process that you can't control, but you can learn to trust yourself in the process. And when I was little, we used to go on float trips in the current river in Missouri. And I thought, this is kind of like the float trip. Um, I'm in this river. Uh, I've never been here before. Um, I'm going with some people and I'm meeting new people. I can't get out of the river. 
I can't control how fast it flows. I can control if I go this way or I move closer to people this way. I can do that. But in a sense, I'm in a process and I just have to go. Mm -hmm. Go with the flow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I so agree. The idea of trying to control everything is so, so exasperating. It is. Oh, it's so difficult. And, you know, I, I like that analogy. I think the same thing is, is getting in the river. Now, there's, you come to a fork and you have influence on which you way you're going to go. But then once you go that way, you really got to let it go. Because to try to go back upstream and yeah. change your mind mm -hmm. and to be constantly going against the current mm -hmm. is just exhausting. It is. And so... Um, you know, there, there's a beautiful line in the poem Desiderata, and it goes, whether you know it or not, the universe will unfold exactly as it should. Yeah. And sometimes the things we want to happen, I mean, it's like Garth Brooks, be, make, thank God for unanswered prayers. I mean, uh -huh. there are times that you think you know what, but you, in the grand scheme of things, where you're going is where you're supposed to be going. Yeah. And there comes a time where you just got to, let it go, make the decisions, you know, nudge it one way or the other when you come to a fork in the road, mm -hmm. but but not be constantly swimming upstream. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I've found too in my practice that people are often trying, to, well, we're so used to doing uh, rather than being. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard for us to receive. And in fact, I had, several conversations this week in my work where you could really tell that we're trying to hang on to things as if we're not sick, as if we don't need help ourselves. I actually use, you know, what we talked about, um, enjoy the beauty that you see all around you, appreciate that. Look all around this room, even a hospital room. My gosh, you've got flowers, you've got cards, you've got two family members, you've got people taking care of you. You've got food to eat. It's beautiful, you know, which they'd see. Mm -hmm. And then do something nice for somebody else. But when I got to number three, <laughs> you could see the resistance. Uh, let somebody do something nice for you. Yeah. It's, it's helpful. It's helpful to, to let go of that and to allow people to care for you because they so desperately want to do that. So you make me feel really good right now because Larry's <laughs> quoting three things that I have, have written that I often remind people of is, uh, you know, every single day, those are three things you need to do is find the beauty all around you, mm -hmm. do something nice for somebody and let somebody do something nice for you. Yes. And uh, the, the, the world works in that reciprocal. You can't always be the giver. Yeah. And it's selfish to always be the giver. And it's selfish to not let somebody take delight in doing something yeah. nice for you. Yeah. And, and you, as you're talking to caregivers or you're talking to patients or you're talking to all of us who want to give and give and give, there comes a time where you're the most generous thing you can do mm -hmm. is gratefully accept the help that you need. It is. You know, my son with, with the, uh, what is it, derecho? The big storm. Yeah, the big great show. Yeah, yeah. That was one of, not one of my better days of uh, how I felt. And I came home from work that day. Was that in September after your surgery? Uh, August 10th. It was in August before, before your surgery. Yeah, according to the family members I've talked yes. to this week. Yes. Um, I came home and I had had trouble walking because I quit driving. Uh, and if you'd ever told me that at 59 I could just stop driving um, and not feel bad about it, I would never have believed you. But I did. Um, and I got home and you could not see from our house to our neighbor's house. And there were two of my neighbors up on the roof, uh, pulling limbs off of our roof. And my wife had told me that she sheltered in the basement with our grandson and just heard things banging against the house. That's all she heard. And, um, she said that the neighbors wanted to get that done so that I wouldn't try to go out there and do it. And I thought they want to help me and I want, and that seems to be important to them. And then my son wanted to rebuild the whole porch. 
And he's got all kinds of things that he's working on his own house. He didn't need to do that. But I could sense he really wanted to do something concrete to help his parents. And he did. And it looks beautiful. And he can come over now and he can say, look at that. Look at the edge on that. That looks really good. But it was, it was something he wanted to do to help. He couldn't provide me radiation. He couldn't do surgery. But he could take that off of me. And that was something that I, I learned, too, was going into something. Don't put pressure on myself to do a bunch of things that I don't need to be doing. Let it go. Let it go. And, and it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you've alluded to something that other patients have told me, you know, we got this list of things that are so important. It's so important. And then you get told you have cancer. And, you know, within a moment, a lot of those things are like... <laughs> I, I think we can just cross those off. That's those, right. those don't need to be done. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. It really uh, focuses in on what's really important. It is. And I would say it's like a transformative experience has been a lot of those things are staying off my list. I don't want to go back to uh, a lot of the busyness of before. And I also don't want to let a lot of the toxicity that I could allow in to come in because I can control some of that. And, um, you know, I've, we lived fairly slowly last year and more simply. And we discovered a lot of treasures within our home that had been in boxes uh, that we saw. And we spent more time together. Again, take someone with you. We spent more time together than we have in all the years that we've ever known each other. And um, I want to continue that reprioritization of what's really important in my life because some things just aren't worth giving the energy to um, it's just not fruitful it's not helpful it's not healing and just i'm just letting those go you can do without it yeah yeah and that frees me up for other things that are much more valuable and much more rich um any other uh, pearls that, and I'm thinking again in terms of how you go about your professional life, mm -hmm. and then maybe expand that anything different. And you already shared some of them that different about how you go about your personal life now, how uh, your cancer journey has changed the dynamics in your family and in any way, shape, or form, um, changed the way you think about the future or making plans or anything? Well, um, I thought about dying a lot, not to be morbid, but I did. And um, I, uh, like I said, in my line of work, I'm around that all the time, um, both before I went to the hospital and, and afterwards. And, uh, but this was a little more immediate. And I thought, well, um, what do I really need to be doing? And uh, my, um, I decided, well, you know what? Because uh, I've always felt that, like with some of my patients who say, um, I think I'm going to die or they told me I'm gonna die. And we talk about that, but I'm also aware that I could on the way home, long before they did. So what would I do differently? Well, my goal really, like if this had been a terminal diagnosis, just to be honest about it, if it had been a terminal diagnosis, what would I do? Well, like I said, some things that I thought were important, they're not important anymore. And maybe they're really not important even now. But I want to be alive until I do die. Whether that was going to be before I turn 60 or whether that's going to be 25 years from now. Either way, the approach is to do what's valuable, what's worth doing, what's fruitful, and to be alive until I'm not.
And I, I think I'm hearing you say that because of the work you do, and I, I find this that most people that are wise have a grasp of their mortality. Yeah. And uh, those that I have the opportunity to work with through a cancer diagnosis, many of them have that wisdom before they even face their own mm -hmm. mortality because you're dealing with mortality mm -hmm. a lot. And, yeah. and you've already had the chance uh, to, to talk to others and help others yeah. face mortality. And in the process of doing that, uh, many of us in that profession come to a understanding of acceptance of death yeah. earlier in our lives than those people who yeah. don't deal with death at yeah. all. And it's yeah. not until they're faced with their own mortality that they think much about it. Yeah. But I'm sure you've read um, many books and thought much about death and dying and how to help people through death and dying and you help people through death and dying and you help people through bereavement mm -hmm. and that whole process mm -hmm. provides you a wisdom that um, uh, that allows you to say, you know, memento mori, remember, we're all going to die. Yeah. And that's not a pessimistic no. statement. It's a clarion call to live today, whether it's going to be one more day or, you know, 20 more years. Yes. How are you going to live today? Yeah, this is what we've got. This is the gift of today. Um, I'm really much more aware of that. I mean, in fact, I'm kind of reorienting around that even more powerfully, I guess, even than ever before. Because uh, to take a breath is miraculous. There's a lot has to happen to take a breath. A lot of my patients are short of breath. And um, really, the spectacular, what the human body can do. Um, um, I told you one of the greatest miracles I experienced was to tie my shoe. Yeah. <laughs> I tied my shoe on Valentine's Day and I cried and it was not a tear of pain. It was tears of joy because it was amazing. I'd worked so hard to have that range of motion to do that. And uh, it's wonderful. So many things have to happen to lean into the glove compartment, your hips involved in that. Um, just so many things that are little, that are so spectacular. They're so miraculous. And I went out for what a, a turning point for me was last fall when my grandson, who was 10 months old at the time, that one, I went out for a walk because I thought I needed to move. I started to get moving. And um, I tried to get in my truck on October 4th and I couldn't get in. Kind of scared me. And I tried to walk to the end of the block and I couldn't do it. And uh, Tuesday, October 6th, I tried to walk to the bike trail, which I had not been on for a long time. And it was two and a half blocks. And it took everything I had to move and get to that bike trail. And when I got there, my son had seen me and my grandson and they stopped. And this little guy, you know, a little self, and I realized he's never heard the leaves rustle. He's never seen the crisp Iowa sky. Uh, he's never dropped a leaf and watched it fall. And he's out there with me. And I am alive. And I can walk. And he's out here for the first time experiencing all of this. And what a miracle that that I can enjoy this with him. And uh, that, that's really kind of the reorientation of my life. It's just the spectacular joy uh, every moment. And not that life doesn't have its challenges, not that it's not a struggle, and not that it can't be frustrating, but to be able to be fully present uh, with another human being. And as you yeah. described, the, the joy that came from tying that shoe yeah. wouldn't have been there had you not been deprived of tying the shoe right. for a while. And That's so right. uh, the true joy that we're talking about 
is not, you know, a hedonistic pleasure of mm -hmm. consumption. It's a joy that goes right through the middle of sorrow. Yeah. It's not a path that goes around sorrow. <laughs> that the true joy includes sorrow in, okay. in its process. That's right. Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you, Larry, for sharing your story with us. Thanks for uh, for uh, also talking about the role of uh, the chaplain and pastoral care in the healing process. Let's open up some questions. We'll, we'll let our live studio audience have first uh, shot at questions and then we'll look at the chat box. Boon. Uh, so uh, the question is, what type of cancer did you have? Well, my understanding is it's a sarcoma, which I'm told is less than 1% of all cancer diagnosed is a sarcoma and that there are multiple varieties within that. And a right. sarcoma is a tumor, a, mal uh, a malignant tumor of what we call connective tissue. That would be muscle, bones, nerves, fascia. So it's a uh, common, it was sarcomas as, as Larry said, is not a common tumor, but uh, having them in the arms and the legs uh, are common places, but they can be pretty much anywhere in your body, but uh, of the extremity. So um, the old fashioned way of curing uh, a sarcoma of the leg is you amputate the leg. It's the easiest way to get rid of the entire tumor. It uh, has some functional um, <laughs> drawbacks. drawbacks. And so um, the current, uh, we talk about how can we do limb sparing treatment, meaning you get to keep your leg, but we get rid of the cancer. But you have to, you can't just take the tumor out and take all the nerves and blood vessels and leave a non-functional leg. That's not a good thing. Uh, and so uh, with uh, soft tissue sarcomas of the extremities, the arms and legs, we often do a little radiation first, try to shrink it down, and then the surgeon removes it, but the surgeon needs to remove it while keeping intact the nerves, the veins, the arteries, so that you know you still have a functional leg, and then get the closure to happen so it can heal. And we always know that the healing can be a little problematic when you do the surgery after radiation. And so sometimes there's some wound healing issues that happen. So mm -hmm. thanks, Poon. Any other questions? Chris, do we have any questions from the, the uh, audience at home? No, not yet. But if anybody would like to ask a question, use the chat box at the bottom or the question and answer, and we will certainly relay those. Yeah, Tim. So I got a question. Is your job non-denominational? So you're a chapman, but you see Catholics and Protestants and Lutherans going through this journey. So you see basically everybody, right? Yeah. Yeah. So just to your door. Tim's question was, uh, as a chaplain, but yet you, a Methodist minister before you became a chaplain, do you serve all different faiths that are in the hospital? Yeah. Yeah. Um, some hospitals make a distinction, and I try to send somebody that's your particular faith community. Mercy has never done that uh, from the start. And so we see everybody. And that's one of the things I really like about this is, you know, in the hospital, people are a lot of the things that separate us, that make us so distinct, uh, begin to fade away. And the things that make us very human kind of rise to the top. So if we deal with each other on a very human level, you know, struggle, joy, all those kind of things, we have a lot to talk about. And uh, I find uh, great receptivity um, because, uh, you know, most people respond to kindness and compassion. And when you're a vulnerable patient in a hospital, uh, kindness and compassion is something you really value. I sure do. You had a really good story. Thank you for sharing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the ending on um, many famous people have said, compassion is my religion. 
Mm -hmm. So, Christopher, we're going to turn it over to you to bring it on home. Wonderful, Larry. Thank you. That was uh, meaningful. To, as a cancer survivor, I could relate wholeheartedly with many things that you said. Uh, this was recorded this evening and will be on our Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel. It will also be on the Mercy One website. If you search the Mercy One Cancer Center for the uh, cancer education series, you'll find all of the recordings there. And as I said, also on our YouTube channel uh, for Above and Beyond Cancer. So thanks for everyone for joining us this evening, and we look forward to connecting again next week. Take care.